having analyzed short run profit curves and how to get from short run cost curves to short run profit curves, we now have to shift our attention to the long run. So this topic now is is long long run profit. There are four cases you'll recall A, B, C, and D. The official names for A and B are constant returns to scale and increasing returns to scale. We'll do C and D in the next video. What you see in front of you are some graphs that come from the class handouts. And actually both cases A and B are kind of odd or unusual. Let's do case A first. So we start with row number one. Constant returns to scale, as you know, as you'll recall, has long run average cost equal long run marginal cost as a constant, so it's a horizontal line. That gives rise to the total cost curve given in row two, namely this one. That total cost curve is a straight line. And that's because average is constant and marginal is constant. And so you'd get that kind of uh, you get that kind of straight line. If it's a little confusing, you can go from row two to row one just to confirm that that is the right total cost curve corresponding to that average cost curve and marginal cost curve. Total costs start at zero in the long run. Because we're in the long run, and in the long run, if you don't want to produce anything, you don't have any fixed costs, so you just you you, d you don't buy any inputs, and your total costs are zero. Um, so how about total revenue? We're going to study long run profit under or with competition. just like we were doing in the short run. So total revenue curves are straight lines coming from the origin. And row number two, here with these, I, I've given two examples of total revenue curve, TR1 with a low price and TR2 with a high price. The next row is what profit looks like. With a low price, you have TR1, and I claim that the profit curve looks like this. The reason is you're comparing TR1 to TC. Well, at Q equals zero, they, they both are zero, so profit's zero. Everywhere else, there's a gap between TR and TC, and TR is below TC, which means that profit's negative. So that's why you have this pretty grim looking profit line, it's negative and it keeps getting more and more negative in a linear fashion. So that explains row number one. Now let me explain number two. That corresponds to a high price giving TR2. Well, here, again, at Q equals zero, both of them are zero, so profit zero. Everywhere else you have this kind of gap. Total revenue is bigger than total cost. It gets bigger and bigger linearly, and the that's the explanation of this kind of total profit curve. So let's see what that implies for the supply curve, row number four. Well, if you have a, a low price that generates a total revenue curve like TR1, and there are an infinite number of such total revenue curves for basically whenever the price is below the average cost you're going to have something like TR1 you're going to have therefore something like pi1 and you're going to want to produce zero so at a price below average cost you're going to supply zero that's what happens in row 4 how about for a price above average cost well then you have like in row 2 TR2 or in row 3 pi 2. If you have something like in row 3 pi 2, you want to produce an infinite amount because profit just gets bigger and bigger and bigger forever. And so in row 4, that explains why 
at a price above average cost, the supply is at infinity, which of course can't really can't really happen. Um, or you'll never have an equilibrium out there. Let's be more precise. That is, this is the way the supply curve looks. What about a price that's that makes TR look at row number two TR right on TC? Well, then in row number three, you'd have profit that's right on the horizontal axis. And so in that intermediate point, you wouldn't care where you'd produce because you'd be making zero profit everywhere. Now, zero profit covers opportunity costs, so the firm's not going to go out of business. It's just It just doesn't care what Q it produces. Any Q is fine. Any Q will make it happy at that particular price. In row, in row four, that's this price here. And at that price, supply is horizontal between zero and infinity because any quantity will make the firm happy. Now to be more precise, that price is equal to average cost. And it's equal to marginal cost, but I think it's easier to remember that it's equal to average cost. Remember we're in the long run, so we don't have to talk about average variable cost or average total cost. All the costs are variable. So, so what we're saying is that when price equals average cost, the firm is making zero profit regardless of what it does. If it produces nothing, it makes zero profit. If it produces 10, it makes zero profit. If it produces a zillion, it makes zero profit. So the supply curve is horizontal at that price. If price is below that level, if it's below the average cost level, perhaps it's better if I erase this part. So if, it, if, it's, if, if price happens to be below average cost, then you produce nothing. And if it's above average cost, you produce infinity. So that generates the, the the kind of weird supply curve that you see in row number four. Let me erase my markings now so that you can see perhaps more clearly what it'll look like. So that's the explanation of the constant returns to scale. There's something interesting to note with constant returns to scale. If you have constant returns to scale, so let me draw that supply curve again. BQ. There are only two possibilities for price. If price is really low, then quantity is zero. Nobody produces the commodity. The commodity doesn't exist in the marketplace. That's not interesting. So the only other possible price is this price, where price equals average cost. Be because if price were bigger than that, you'd have the observed result that supply were infinity, and you're never going to get demand equal to supply with an infinite supply. So either the commodity doesn't exist, or it sells at average cost. And you conclude that without knowing where demand is. In other words, this is a situation, the constant returns to scale case, is a situation where as long as the commodity exists, you're talking about a commodity that you can actually see in the marketplace, price is going to be average cost regardless of demand. Now one of the big differences between the classical school and the neoclassical school of economics was that the classical school said this, costs determine price. You want to know how much it costs? Uh, you, know, you want to know what the price of a pencil is? What's the average cost of production? That tells you. The neoclassical school said, no, wait a minute. You, you can't tell price just from knowing costs. You also have to have demand. You know, the neoclassical school was famous for saying, is famous for saying, you need to know supply and demand. And supply comes from cost, but you need to know demand too. If you don't know demand, you don't know what price is. Well, if you have constant returns to scale, which of course is a long run concept, then you don't need to know what demand is. Then this is the picture, and so price is equal to average cost regardless of demand. So that's an interesting point to make that the classicals were correct as far as constant returns to scale is concerned. All right, now I'm going to erase my marks and we'll move to case B. So for case B, row number one has falling long run average cost, and that corresponds in row number two to a, to a total cost function that is concave. 
for example, uh, lines from the origin look like this, like this, like this. And so that would be falling average cost, and that's exactly what we have in row number one. So I drew total cost correctly. Total revenue for competition, which we're always talking about here. Total revenue is a straight line starting from the origin because price is constant. So that explains row number two in column B. How about row number three? It, with these dots indicate where total revenue equals total cost, so where profit is equal to zero. Profit's also equal to zero at Q equals zero. That's always true in the long run. In between those two points, total revenue is here and total cost is here, so profit's negative. After that point, total revenue is above total cost, and so profit's positive, and it keeps on getting more and more positive. That is going to generate some weird, well, oh, oh, a weird conclusion. In row number three, if that's your profit possibility, you're just going to pick Q equals infinity. So in row number four, you get this really bizarre supply curve that's vertical at a quantity of infinity regardless of what the price is. There is no, think about row number four, there is no demand curve that will ever hit that supply curve because there's, because people can't afford an infinite amount of their commodity. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that there's a contradiction between assumption B column B and competition. Any demand curve is going to look something like this, so there's not going to be a competitive equilibrium. That doesn't mean that the increase in returns to scale is an impossible technology. What it means is that increasing returns to scale plus competition won't work. So you have to have increasing returns to scale plus non-competition, like monopoly. That'll work. But increasing returns to scale with competition won't work. Let's see why not. Increasing returns to scale means your the bigger your quantity, the lower your average cost. And so if you can increase quantity, you bring your costs down, your average costs down. Ha, that's not going to be compatible with competition where every little firm is teeny tiny and thinks it can't affect the price. If you have increased returns to scale, and you start out with any one firm being bigger than the others, even just by a little bit. The firm that's a little bit bigger, that has Q a little bit larger, can undercut the others because it has a lower average cost. And so it's going to underprice them. It's going to get bigger. The bigger it gets, the lower its average cost, the more it can outcompete the other firms. And so finally, there's going to be only one firm left. And certainly, that's not a competitive situation. So the bottom line for column B is that increasing returns to scale is incompatible with competition. You just can't have increasing returns to scale and competition. It doesn't work. All right, that finishes cases A and B. We'll next do cases C and D.